Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Jesse Colin Jackson, the Executive Director of UCI's Beale Center for Art and Technology, located behind me. And I'd like to welcome you to the second of our four events in our speaker series this year, focused on urgent conversations between art and ecology. And when I'm done speaking, I'll put a link to the entire series in the chat. Um, and I hope you can join us again for our March 9 conversation with Hans Bauman for our April 11 panel discussion focused on art and oceanography, which will conclude the series. You can also check out our event recordings on the Illuminations website, including last week's event with Carolina Kaikato. Tonight's event is a special highlight in the series. We're here to discuss the work of Ian Ingram, whose mid-career survey exhibition remains open in the Beale Center through March 9. Again, I'll point you to the big red building behind me. Please come join us in real life. We'd love to see you there. Um, we'll be having a closing reception on March 5th from 2 to 5 p.m. in case you missed the opening in the fall. Um, Ian's show has been a long time coming, delayed since before the pandemic, and I want to thank him for his patience with us as we've worked through some reopening jitters. We're so pleased to be able to support Ian and his work. Before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge that the University of California, Irvine is located on the ancestral and unceded shared territory of the Ahashiman and Tonva peoples which extend from the Santa Ana River to Aliso Creek and beyond. We are grateful for these original stewards of the land where we live, work, and study, who, despite the history of violence and racism, forced displacement, land theft, and colonialism, still hold strong cultural, spiritual, and physical ties to this region. So though we're on Zoom, we want this to be an interactive event. Um, please type in any questions in the window provided, the kind of Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. You're welcome to do that at any time, and we'll kind of get to questions in due course. We want to maximize our time for these questions, so I'm going to do some very important thank yous in advance. I'd like to thank our guests Ian Ingram, Steve Mahler, and Carissa Terranova for joining us tonight. I'd like to thank UCI Illuminations, the Claire Trevor School of the Arts, and the Beale Family Foundation for supporting this series, and the Warhol Foundation for supporting Ian's exhibition. I'd like to especially thank UCI Art MFA candidate Margaret Oakley, who has been working tirelessly for the past year to bring you our Art and Ecology series. Lastly, I'd like to thank David Familian, our artistic director and the curator of Ian's show. Over the past 10 years, David has established the Beale Center for Art and Technology as the most vital new media venue in Los Angeles and among the best in the United States. Having helped us land funding from the Warhol Foundation, the Getty Trust, the French American Cultural Exchange, among others, David has a rich suite of exhibitions planned through fall 2024 when we'll be part of the next Pacific Standard Time. I'm now going to hand things off to David to introduce our guests. Thank you, um, Jesse, for your generous introduction. Um, I'm gonna quickly just, before I uh, start, share um, installation shots of the exhibition. Um, so I'm going to do that. All right. So um, I'm gonna um, introduce Ian and just to give you a general idea of, um, where else he's exhibited, he'll discuss sort of, um, um, do a short introduction of his work to get us started. Um, Ian is um, exhibited internationally, including the Andy Warhol F Foundation, the Nikolaj Kunstall in Copenhagen, Denmark, the Museum of Modern Art, Toluca, Mexico, um, Yada Gallery in Nagoya, Japan, Bedford Gallery in Walnut Creek, um, I Level Gallery in Halifax, Canada, um, and um, the Zome Source, Amsterdam, Netherlands. Um, and, and so um, my first question for you, Ian, is, so um, Ian, can you discuss the conceptual framework that, um, um, that your work shares? And obviously, if people have seen the ex exhibition, they'll notice um, there's a, big change in his work uh, visually in, um, in during the in the exhibition. So he'll probably talk about that also. So I will um, send it over to Ian. Okay, so maybe I'll, I'll um, show some images of work from before and discuss it relatively quickly. And uh, of course, thank you to everybody for coming and um, and I'll get going on that. So uh, I, I've got a lot to show you. So I'm gonna probably zoom through things a little quickly, but 
in general, I call this, this talk animal looking, which is meant to reference the idea of how we look at animals as human beings, how animals themselves look at the world, and also what it means to, to look like an animal, uh, which are themes that kind of end up in my work in a lot of different places. And so um, I have a chronological set of things I'm going to show you. This is On Beyond Duckling from the early 2000s. I was interested in artificial symbiosis, but I ended up settling on what I, I decided to call sculptural symbiosis, where I was making these objects that were meant to cohabitate in natural settings with animals and plants and things. And in this case, on Beyond Duckling, you put it in a pond and then it rose to the middle of the pond using its feather oars and it's floating on the eggshells that give it buoyancy. And then it does a mating dance in the middle of the pond for a mate that doesn't exist. And then I was also, I made this object, little old me, that's trying to explain the internal combustion engine to animals in the forest. And this is a, a robot that has a loving relationship with a tree. It tries to rake a circle of the tree's own leaves around the tree. And this sort of idea of a sculptural symbiosis, this sort of durational sculptural building up of a form related to the object that's there, the tree. And another uh, strong facet of my work is this idea of, of gestures as a source of meaning. So these are just slabs of rubber that that swim in a window. And this is sort of an anti-interactive work where people aren't meant to know that the, the work is interested in them and is actually looking for a leader. And whenever it sees someone with enough gusto and in their step, it turns around and follows them. But the, the sculpturally, the only sort of sense that these things are things comes from the fact that they're moving, that they're, they're wiggling like fish. And having felt guilty about having never made a mate for On Beyond Duckling, I later made a pair of robots, On Beyond Mother Goose and On Beyond Father Gander, that do a mating ritual together. They can feel the Earth's magnetic field. And even though they're very far away from one another, they, uh, they do a synchronized dance because they have synchronized clocks. And then I made a, a giant robot, or at least from, by my standards, pretty big. This is, the hand itself is 22 feet tall. This is on top of the Andy Warhol Museum in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And this was meant as a, a giant pigeon appreciation machine because they're kind of an animal that lives with us, but we don't give them a lot of credit for all they do for us. And so there were other pieces of this sort of foam sports fan giant that I presume kind of lived underneath the city of Pittsburgh. There was a breast, one pound of flesh. There was an ear, ear number one. And there was a nose, nose your number. And then when pigeons visited, this the giant hand would point them out and try to give them some appreciation. But the real problem there was that they didn't really understand what was going on, which is actually a common theme in a lot of the things I'm making, deliberate sometimes and other times not so deliberate. This is a, an object that you plug into a wall that has a little bit of manure underneath a layer of cellophane and then a mixture of milk, honey, and gelatin and underneath another layer. And then maggots hatch from eggs in the manure and then they find the milk and honey and the flies that, that, that live there have sort of a perfect life in the gallery where this thing's been plugged into the wall. But a true perfect life needs some adversity. So if someone claps, the, the, the cow tail wags to give them something to fight against. So I was also trying to, as I said, find ways to give back to other animals. And I had a space agency, and this is a lunar gravity simulator for earthworms. I'm not going into a whole lot of detail, but there'll be a chance to ask questions about these things if you want. And these are robots that believe that they're on an extraterrestrial planet looking for life, because that's what I presume uh, the Roombas think about doing when they're, you know, vacuuming your floor. And I wanted to experiment with sort of an allegory of the cave kind of thing where the robots really believed that's what they were doing and didn't know any better because of this, the simpleness of their sensorium. And this, of course, ties into the idea of the umwelt and the way an, an animal's umwelt and a human's umwelt and a robot's umwelt are all sort of considerations in making objects that, that, that sort of uh, interrogate that space. So this is another one where the... Um, the, the shadow is the, the robot's own sense of what's happening. And this is a bigger version in a science museum that was part of an exhibition for seven years that was called Robo World. And in this case, the sensing system above, which you can't see in this image, it's on that boom, is looking for, the premise here is that the, the robots are looking for extraterrestrial life. They think they're finding it. And this is a slice of cheese that's being cast, um, the shadow of it's being cast to play the role of the moon. It's a little bit like Petit Prince, you know, with these, these boots that are, marching along and then the camera's looking for 
fish and people, and when it sees them, it thinks that they are extraterrestrial life and turns after them. Oh, there you can see the projection. So there had been a long time of an interest in trying to do some, give back to animals in some way or help them. And then I had all these things. I showed you little old me, which was trying to explain the internal combustion engine to the animals, the chipmunks and the deer, but um, really they had no idea. And I decided to start using signals that were salient to the animals because they were the animal's own signals. And that's what I did with Danger Squirrel Nutkin. The video is in the exhibition, so you could check it out. We, but I think I'm going to skip ahead um, so we don't take too long. And then I made a robot um, that uh, called the Woodiest, which fulfilled two functions. It was in uh, a piece called Extraterrestrial Sex, because it was in some ways my first animal sex bot, which was a whole line of things that I was working on and still am, really. And then it was also in a piece called Nobody C Told the Woodpeckers, which was um, a way to create a translation machine between black woodpeckers that live in Eurasia and American woodpeckers, the pile woodpecker, if they were to meet because of anthropogenic climate change, their territorial signals would be misunderstood potentially by the other species. And so this robot listens for the territorial drumming of one species and translates it into the other. And then once it's completed that, it uh, explains in Morse code anthropogenic climate change, because as I said, nobody told the woodpeckers about what we're doing and they really have a right to know. And then, um, this is a, a robot that en enters the territorial disputes of, of Western fence lizards who are kind of little tiny gunslingers always ready to sort of fight each other with push-ups, which is their territorial display. But this robot, like Ewell Brenner's cowboy gunslinger in, in Westworld, can do the push-ups too and can recognize them. And so it ends up fighting the lizards. And of course, the lizards have to do other things because they have a a limited energetic budget. They have to raise their young and mate and eat and everything else. And the robot only has to fight. And so uh, the, clearly the robot wins. And then in the same sense, I made a, a follow on, which was meant to be a kind of God to the lizards. In this case, reducing the morphological characteristics of the object to the minimum to do the push ups, but then doubling them so that it becomes a supernormal stimulus, which is a, a real phenomenon in animals, including humans where you can take a stimulus and then either multiply it or make it larger and somehow it's more intense to the animals. So this is, I'll just play this because it's quick and this is a sort of double stacked version of the, um, of the, uh, of the push up gesture. In this case, without any lizards there, it either works because it, it is the Uber idol show that declares ultimate territory in this area or it's something that's super formed with the lizards and they don't really want to deal with it. And then I made a follow on from that that I won't explain here, I'll just skip. And then I began to work with a different kind of signal that only works if the, the, uh, the observer, in this case, a magpie, has a theory of mind. This is the beak wipe. And I could, I'll explain more about that maybe later. But I used that again in this piece that was in the Northern uh, Arctic of, of Finland, where this object is again using the beak wipe to tell stories about the end of the world to the reindeer and the ravens and the magpies and the other animals that were there. It's specifically looking for corvids, for magpies and ravens and crows. And it has two beaks and it tries to tell a given individual one story. These are all human stories of the end of the world. And another one, a different story. There's stories like mythological stories like Ragnarok, science-based stories like meteor strikes and they all get killed. And then also the sorts of stories the politicians tell their constituents about how the end of the world is being brought upon by another group of people. So I'll call, I won't play the whole video, but this is also in the exhibition plus the robot. This is another sex bot for pigeons. I won't stay on it for too long. And then we get into some of the new work that I did in collaboration with, with Steve Mahler, who was part of this panel, including Elongate Evans, which was the first um, our object built for the rats, which because they are so keen on, on chewing on things and interrogating things with their sharp teeth. It meant that I had to armor my robots in a way that I generally don't do, um, leading to these objects that have shells, which I don't usually have. I won't talk about this too much, but this is a piece that I'm again gonna be showing with my collaborator, Tun Karelsa in the Milan Triennial uh, in a couple of months. It's, a, it's an artificial intelligence system that learns about ecosystems on its own in order to, um, to try to 
understand them differently than we understand them and argue and potentially becoming a, a representative in a Bruno Latourian parliament of things. And then this is some of the work from the show as well. I'm not gonna show actually a lot of it, but I am gonna show these two pieces that, um, that came from that one piece I just showed you, Elongate Evans. This is, uh, these are objects that are called rats re-embodied as robots. And I was interested in the way that synanthropic animals, which means the animals that are most uh, closely aligned to ourselves that live in our spaces and live amongst us, pigeons and rats and, and cockroaches and so on, the way that they are integrated into our built environment. And so with, with this piece, Rat King, I uh, put these robots that in inherit formal aspects from, from rats themselves and from sort of conventional robot tropes and embedded them in an entangled sort of way in a building in these spaces that rats live in, like under the sink or in the ceiling tile above the office or in the, the attic space or in the basement. And uh, in the show, you can see these are arranged as a sort of pentaptic of these objects that are going through these vaguely ratty gestures over and over again in these spaces. And then the last piece I'll show, and then we'll continue from there, is a, a whisker where I had, for a long time, um, uh, well, in many ways, this is sort of about uh, what rats can't be. So in Steve's garage one night when I was hanging out with the rats in the dark, I, had, I, was, I saw the light coming in from the garage door and, and making really evident the, the whiskers of the rats. And I was beginning to get my head around the way the sensorium of the rats is so focused on the whiskers and on smell and definitely not on sight. And I was also imagining the, the way that rats live in our spaces and how they live in general and the limitations of being a prey species like a rat. And so with the whisker, I kind of went in a totally different direction where I, um, uh, I made a piece that gets to do something that rats don't do, which is to have long lingering liaisons with flowers in the broad daylight. So these the whisker has whiskers and it sits by a flower and then it just sort of touches the flower, uh, you know, for hours where a rat would be scared to be. So that's uh, all I'll show just as a kind of um, intro to my work in case you're not too familiar with it. And uh, some of the work from before and some of the work um, that was, was made in, during the residency with the Beal uh, the Black Box Projects residency that I've been doing for the last five years with Steve. So I'll stop my share and then perhaps mute my. Okay. Thank you, Ian. That was great. And I just wanted to say that Ian was already working, normally with Black Box Projects, the artist and, and I collaborate to find the people they want to work with. And Ian was already working with Steve before we even started. So it's kind of a, um, it's very, um, made it a lot easier for, because they already had a relationship and in, 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 in working together. Um, so my next question is for Stephen, can you describe your collaboration with Ian over the, which is the longest period of any of our residencies? Um, can you describe um, how you worked together, what you got out of the experience and did it affect your research at all? Yeah, great. Uh, thank you, David. Um, yeah, so I guess I can start just by introducing myself. I'm a professor of neuroscience here at UC Irvine, and my own research is involved in uh, studying the brain circuits underlying motivation and addiction. And I do this research in rats, which I use as a model of human brain function. In fact, um, rats seem to experience a lot of the same emotions and pleasures and desires and fears as humans do. Um, yet they are a distinct organism as well with their own evolved way of experiencing uh, and interpreting uh, the world and also uh, interpreting and experiencing us as humans. In fact, they kind of live at the margins of our own society and they feed off our garbage. And um, long story short is that I'm kind of a fan of rats. And as Ian mentioned, I do have them as pets as well. And so, um, you know, I found Ian through his uh, art on Twitter, and I just thought his work was really interesting and kind of, I was really excited by the idea that he was exploring that intersection of kind of technology and biology, which has a lot to do with the kind of stuff we do in the lab as well in a very different ways. 
And so I asked him to come down to Irvine to, um, to, to kind of talk and I showed him his, my lab and we started hanging out. And as we became friends, I, um, you know, I convinced him basically, I think of how interesting rats are as a species. And um, since then he's taught me a whole lot about how an artist might look at this same organism. That's kind of one of my favorite animals. And um, he taught me, um, you know, so to kind of question some of my assumptions maybe about how rats experience their worlds and how we experience them and so on. And uh, I guess um, I'm not sure that this, this collaboration has, has directly uh, altered my own research, although I, I will say that there's one prospect in which that could potentially happen. Um, one of the things rats do that is interesting is they communicate ultrasonically in a way that us humans can't hear. So they kind of have their own secret little language amongst themselves. And we started eavesdropping on them. And, you know, Ian and I have, have talked over the years about um, ways in which to use uh, machine learning approaches and things like that to try to decode this language as well. And so it's something we're kind of actively working on in the lab, um, specifically with a grad student named Kate Lawson. And I guess I'll uh, just kind of stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. I just want to comment on what you said. That is my goal with black box projects that both participants share something uh, in a deep way with the, re the research they're doing. And hopefully it leads to, and some others have led to um, NSF grants and trying to collaborate further. So I'm really glad to hear that that seemed to happen too. And I, and we had, I knew about the ultrasonics because we were gonna include that in the show, but I don't, I, but it is something I'll be interested in following as you guys work on it more. Stay tuned. So thank you very, yeah, thank, thank you very much. Um, Carissa, so you can introduce yourself too. My question for you um, relates to your um, essay that you're writing for the catalog. And you um, and, and excuse my mispronunciation of names and the names of the questioners. I'm very bad at um, mentioning names, but um, you mentioned Raul uh, Franci, um, who, um, who actually influenced El Linsky, Lohal, um, Lozalo, Mahalanaj, um, Mies van der, Voor, uh, van der Rohe in his discussion of the relationship of nature and technology. Um, there was an introduction of organic systems thinking that he had influenced modern art and design. And finally, I'd be curious since you've done a lot of work on DR DRC Wentworth Thompson, it seems they both had a lot to offer for, our, uh, for artists and designers in their research and they lived at the, around the same time and they they seem to have crossed disciplines in similar way. So Carissa, um, you are on. Thank, ooh, wow, that's kind of loud. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I hope I'm not too loud, right? I, um, so you ask about Raoul Francais um, and then Darcy went with Thompson. These are two distinct figures that I don't know if they ever knew each other's work. Um, they're two scientists. Raoul Francais was a botanist, an Austro-Hungarian botanist active. His years of, uh, he was 1874 to 1943. And then Darcy Wentworth Thompson is a Scottish zoologist, 1860 to 1948. So they're roughly uh, parallel. They're living in the same time as one another. Raoul Francais is uh, probably lesser known of the two. and. Uh, he was a botanist who was a popular scientist, popular science writer, I should say, um, 120 years ago, you know, at the turn of the century, uh, the last century. And he was selling his books like hotcakes. And one of them, I think, which is good for this uh, dialogue we're having, was um, a mind in plants. So he was thinking about conscious, other forms of consciousness at work, um, other, not even you know, beyond mammals. Um, and so for him, the consciousness of a plant would not be within a plant, but it would be more systems oriented. So it would be in its relational uh, in activities with soil, gravity, sun, and light, and you know, of course, other um, other plants around the, that given plant. And his his work was read um, by men, members of the uh, German Bauhaus, the design school that was active in Germany, and then kind of spread out once the fascists came to power. So they were it was the Weimar Republic when all that was happening. So it's very interesting because um, the people who picked up on his ideas and brought them into modern design and modern art 
were like Laszlo Maholy Naj, as you've mentioned, Elizitsky and uh, Mies van Rohe, among others. And they don't literally translate his ideas into like curvilinear forms like Art Nouveau. These ideas take ma manifest and really in, in, in many ways in systems art, right, in, in its earlier stages. So for Maholy Naj, it would be interactive um, light and TV, working with television, actually, which is so wonderful that Maholy was writing about that. Um, Darcy Thompson, on the on the other hand, or not, they're not really opposed, but distinct from uh, Francais, was a zoologist in um, Scotland who wrote on growth and form, which is a text that was published in, in uh, 1917, um, and um, then again in 1942 in an expanded version. And uh, he he the book was it, it, so you, it, it emerges around the time of genetics, but he's not terribly interested in genetics. What he's interested in is the way um, organic form is shaped by forces, physical forces, not you know genetics beyond genetics, right? Because genetics is burgeoning at that time, new thing. But he's comparing skeletal frameworks with, uh, or you know, animals skeletons with with bridges and things like that. So. It's a, a book that architects immediately uh, tune into. And then, of course, across the 20th century into our own moment that artists as well tune into, um, like artists in the <laughs> British context in the 1950s. So uh, 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 Dick Richard Hamilton uh, and the, the sort of the independent group and pop artists in, in the 50s and the early 60s in the British context are reading on growth and form, oddly enough. So, I mean, I think for me, what I, in my essay I wrote, um, I'm interested in the in the role that they play in kind of generating um, organic oriented or biologically rooted um, systems thinking in the 20th century, and then how Ian Ian's work is a, is 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 it root kind of comes out of this too, but it's something that we could think of as second order systems thinking, and the first order systems thinkers are the are the people who are recognizing um, rather than art, an artifact uh, unto its own and a kind of um, uh, diachronic li lineage that goes, you know, linear in a linear fashion through through time and even evolution, but rather um, an organism um, and its connections to its its uh, its relational setting in, in kind of a synchronic moment, and um, and so um, that systems thinking in the in the in the 20th century it really based on an idea of a of a, of a human recognizing the system, looking into it. And not understanding that by seeing the system, you are actually involved with it and, and affecting it, and then it's affecting you as well. And once we get to that part, which is really where Ian is coming from in his work, we, we, we move into something called second order systems or second order cybernetic systems, where you understand yourself to be, a, by looking at something, you're actually perceiving it and then creating it, you know, sometimes creating it, but also interacting and affecting it. And then, of course, it's in a feedback loop affecting you, which is quite different from the first order of systems, which is all the, where all these people are coming from. But you wouldn't have a recognition of any systems oriented thinking without first order. So you wouldn't have second order as well. I hope that makes sense. But one thing further, I'm really glad that Ian's that I was in, so got so closely um, involved with Ian's work. I know I've known it for a couple of his work for a couple of years, but I really got to really in, integrate into his world by reading a lot of his own work. And it allowed me to crystallize some some work I'm doing in, in my own research, writing about 20th century um, systems and second order systems thinkers in art and design. So uh, bravo, Ian. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Carissa. You you actually entered a question I'm going to ask a little later. Um, so, but about observing. So, um, but that was really good because I'm working on an exhibition for the Getty that has to do with complex systems. So, um, was fast. I um, was interested in that too. Um, so, um, I, 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 um, so for Ian, um, one of the things that um, um, that drew me to your work. Um, when I included you in the birds exhibition, um, when I first, when you first showed at the Beale as part of a group exhibition, um, was the different ways um, of seeing that you have in your work. Um, like the, uh, there's sort of Disney nature films from the 60s, scientific documentation and video video art. And I'm wondering, you know, how you uh, see the, because um, I think we've discussed that 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 some of this is in your work and how you navigate through these different styles um, in the making of your, um, especially the videos documenting um, your work in, in, the, in, in nature. 
Yeah. Well, I think there's a, a little bit of a backstory there. And then when I began to make these pieces that were intended for these quote unquote wild places, uh, I think I had more optimism or more un, un, well-placed optimism that folks would come and see them. And I imagine these pilgrimages that people would make to come see the, the robot that I built on a given, in a given forest and whatnot. And I realized that that wasn't gonna happen. <laughs> so <laughs> the, the very, I made a, a piece that actually was in a gallery that explained where it wanted you to go into a, in a forest. And, uh, and there were a couple of people, one of whom was a cryptography student who actually went to the location where the rest of the installation was. But it became more and more clear that I needed to, I had to, uh, to bring these pieces back to a human audience, even though an animal audience is a big part of their target, that I had to, to make documents. And uh, the very act of making documents is, um, uh, is a changing. In some ways, it relates to what Carissa was just saying. You, uh, you change things. And I, I'm really interested in animal stories. It's, you know, I had to whip through my my talk is we only have a little bit of time for that, but I would usually emphasize that I'm very interested in the stories that we tell about animals and how many of them are apocryphal and how that affects our relationship with animals. And increasingly, as people don't have real life interactions with animals, as John Berger pointed out, um, they, um, they, the, the stories kind of get even more out of control. Um, and there's, a, there's often a mistake about what uh, animals really are doing. There always has been. I mean, even back when we were closer to animals in the medieval bestiaries, people were, uh, were kind of making up stuff that they didn't know. So at the same point that we're able to peek deeper into animals' lives using modern uh, camera technology and everything else, we've also reframed their lives oftentimes in nature documentaries in ways that are at, at, at best misleading, at, most, at worst <laughs> apocryphal. And, and one of the most famous examples, of course, is the 1950s nature documentary that, that Disney's nature documentary folks did where they, uh, Disney, Walt well, Disney himself had read in a book that lemmings throw themselves off of cliffs when the population gets large. And the, the documentary and crew went out to, to witness this, didn't witness it, but Disney demanded it. So they threw lemmings off a cliff and filmed it. And then that was in the documentary and the documentary won an Academy Award and hence now we know, in quotes, we know that lemmings do this when they never do. Um, so this is sort of the, the maybe the, the best example of nature documentary that told you a story that wasn't true. And so in some of my work, I'm actually playing with the tropes, deliberately playing with the tropes of nature documentaries and the framings that they do um, to, to explore that. Is that sort of getting into the space of your question? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, good. Okay. Um, let me see. Um, so one of the things um, that mo um, I think almost all the black box artists that we've shown had is they they have a deep understanding of the science and they do a lot of research in in um, even before they meet with whatever researcher. Um, um, they, they end up working with um, um, so that they share a common language. Can you talk a little bit how you your research into the scientific aspects of you know mating and you know like the lizard push-ups and all these things was some of it based on your observation or some of it was your researching through science um, and maybe Stephen has some ideas about this. Um, um, well, I guess everyone's coming back. Um, um, so yeah, just describe the kind of research you do on that aspect, because as we talked about your work, that I would always come up the specific behavior, and you mentioned that a little bit in your introduction, but just the kind of research you do, because that's something that I find works really well with our residencies, because the scientists appreciate that the artist understands um, the field that they're uh, working together on. Sure. Um... Well, what I, one thing I always say is that I'm not doing science. What I'm doing is kind of science-y. <laughs> it's sort of really important to know the distinction in, between what is science and what isn't, I think specifically now when there's a, almost a war on science ongoing. Um, but I do do research and I do a bunch of things that I would call research. Um, and a part of that is looking at what scientists have done and 
you know, when it came to the woodiest, the woodpecker robot, I found a paper that was about the mating rituals of woodpeckers, because in the, the version of the woodiest where it's an extraterrestrial sex bot, it's, um, it's actually performing the, the mating ritual of the, of the pileated woodpecker. And then there's an aspect of the research that's, that's responsive to the animals themselves. So that, you know, I talked about stories and the stories that we tell about animals. Uh, oftentimes I'm kind of starting with a story that's not true about what will happen with my robots. I have a narrative, almost a cinematic narrative of what will happen when I make the robot. And at this point, you know, for the last 15 years even, I know that when I go and I make something and put it out there, the animals won't behave in the way I predict. And so then I iteratively respond to what they do do. And that informs the object in many ways, you know, sculpturally, behaviorally, um, narratively, and so on. So maybe there's something that Steve could jump in on at this point. Yeah, I guess uh, that's kind of the, the name of the game for the kind of research I do is we're really trying to get inside these rats' heads, both figuratively in the sense of like, what are they thinking, so to, so to speak? Um, how do they perceive the world? What do they do about that? And literally in the case of our research, um, and this is how we you know, push around these brain circuits and things like that. Um, so yeah, I guess um, the, the perspective of the rat is, is, is really uh, essential for what we do. You know, we are trying to understand humans ultimately, but we are studying rats. And so kind of seeing the world through their eyes is, 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 is really crucial. And that's, that's something I think that um, this collaboration with Ian has, has really helped me with. You're muted, David. Um, Carissa, maybe you have a little bit to say because in your essay you mentioned, while he doesn't do quantifiable science, there's a science, like what Ian says, a sciencey part of it. Well, what in I want to what I want to respond to is something that Steve has just said, which is that um, the the his the the overlap between both of what their research and what they're doing is this um, try like. How do you know science and humans have for years? So supposed to, so of course, especially humanists for for hundreds of years tried to understand humans. But the only way you're going to understand a human ontologically is to understand others around us, right? Of all the other creatures, and it's it's amazing that it's taken so long <laughs> for us to realize this. That in order to to really get it at our own world, I mean, because our own world is everything around us, and it's every other living creature. So. Um, I mean, what I'm interested in and, and what you both are doing is um, a big philosophical shift for the for Americans and but every, all humans around the world. But how can we this gets into this the talk series uh, at UCI ecological questions of how are we going to fix things and there's fixing through practical means of, you know, um, remediation and in, in, in machines and how we can do this, which is you're, you're, you're working on, uh, you know, in some way, but both of you at some level. But I mean, I'm part of the, the group that spearheads the philosophical shift and the rhetorical shift for people in language and thinking, which is, um, again, you know, understanding, in order to understand yourself, you have to understand the things around you, because you'll never understand anything about yourself unless you're looking outside of yourself. Um, at, and not just at other selves as humans, but the selfhood, if we can think about it, of a rat <laughs> or a lizard or um, a duck um, or a raven, right? So um, I guess I should hurl back a question to Ian. Um, well, my, I have a question, but it's totally unrelated, so I shouldn't take us into another territory with Ian's work. What are your, th I mean, what are your thoughts on selfhood and other, in a non-human life and mind and consciousness? Um, well, I don't know about selfhood, but I, I think it might be worth, you know, I used the word umwelt earlier when I was talking about pieces, and I think it's a, you know, an, an important sort of concept for what you were just talking about, Chris. And so the, the guy who coined it, Von Uxko, was actually trying to point out that we don't, humans don't see the world perfectly. His contemporaries, and even our contemporaries, often believe that we as human beings understand the world as it really is. And what Von Oak School was saying was that we don't, and that the way that we see our world is totally mediated by our sensorium, our senses, our body, uh, maybe our instincts. And you know, he used classically the example of the tick, which has a very simple set of sensors, but and therefore has a totally different understanding of the world. And of course, there's Thomas Nagel who wrote about the bat and the notion that the uh, the bat having a sensorium, even as it's spatial, is so based off of sound that we almost can't conceive of what's that of what that is like. And 
the you know the robots that I make in that they're meant to enter the space. In fact, they're meant to kind of enter the, the in multiple sort of umwelt simultaneously and create a messy web between what is understood by the human and what is understood by the non-human and, and what is theoretically understood by other robots that are part of the the um, the installation um, are sort of all about that idea. Um, and it, 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 it sort of folds back on, on robots as well, because robots are these things that were, that are technologies, they're artificial, they're things we're trying to make. And I always argue that we've been trying to make them for millennia, that they're not, you know, as, only as old as the word, which is only hundred years old. Um, and when, but when we do succeed, we'll have made these things that can reflect upon the nature of their own origins. And they'll be, uh, well, one of the things that's important about that is that then they can they, 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 they'll see what, what of our legacy we passed on to them. And I think it feels as if there's a lot to be done there to make sure that's not the negative aspects of our activity. That's why I think the play and humor and, and interactions with other animals and a sort of love for ecosystems and, um, and the environment as a whole is something that we can imbue in these robots that has, hasn't been given them and especially wasn't being given them when I started this project in the 90s, you know. Um, I don't know, is that getting anywhere close to what you're talking about, Krista? <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, yeah. it's your work um, really reveals um, that the problematic of, of, of studies of mind and studies of consciousness that, that you could never, they were never meant to be understood in terms of um, a vacuum, that any understanding of consciousness must be understood in terms of consciousness in relation to other consciousnesses. But the problem with consciousness is that it was originally conceived of as only in human heads, <laughs> and only, not even in our bodies. So yeah, this is the revolution at work in what you're doing. And I think in what Mo uh, Professor Mahler is doing as well is that it, if we're ever going to understand consciousness, it's not, a, you cannot understand it in and of itself essentially, but it has to be porous and relational and uh, mediated and, and uh, prosthetic at some level attached. Because I have a student who's working on work, grappling with um, very similar kind of work, but on more digital online and conscious that how do we understand a thing? What, what, are, what are the rights of an object? And, and you know, because then it's so on the one hand, it's just to, to make us think um, de decentral, decenter, decenter human consciousness. But consciousness itself was it cannot be understood on its own, but it must always be understood according to what's next to it on all sides, you know? So I'll just stop. We have questions. And I, just, I just add that I, I think it should be understood in its own terms. And so that's, I think, one of the key things in terms of comparing humans to animals is we care about sort of different things in some ways. Um, we, uh, you know, our worlds are very visual, for example, and rat's world is very, you know, not visual. It's, uh, you know, involving smell and touch and things like that much more. And this, I think, is the kind of concept of, of Ian's work. And I think that using, like, taking machines like robots, AI, et cetera, things that we humans create. And that comes from our own perspective. Like, what do we care about? What are we trying to look for? What is the sort of input to these uh, systems that we're giving it from our own conscious perspective and seeing how that interacts with the animals. And, and I found it really intriguing when Ian said that oftentimes he was surprised by what the animals did because he sort of came in with his own perspective. Like my robot's gonna do this and it's gonna interact with the animals that way. And the animals, you know, didn't quite see it that way. And I think that could be really instructive even maybe in a broader way um, in terms of us trying to understand, you know, even the person across the streets consciousness who may have a very different perspective on the world and so on. Um, I, there's a question by um, Giesman um, Oktai. Um, my question for Mr. Ingram is Levi Strauss once said animals are good to think with. Uh, would Mr. Ingram think his art is good for animals beyond the inherent value of the artistic work? I'm curious how he thinks these works are altering animal perception, if it does. It sort of fits in what we're just talking about. If that makes sense. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I do think, I mean, I'm trying to make things that are good for animals. I think, you know, as Steve just said, it's sort of important for us to understand what... A, the, the possibility that the, the animal's consciousness, if they've got it, is different than ours. Um, you know, Franz Duvall is, is, is talking about this a lot. In science, there was a long period where it was almost verboten to, to talk about other non-human animals having a, um, a consciousness, and now we're finally getting over that. Um, there's almost definitely, in my opinion, as a non-scientist, a continuum um, of consciousness, and we just don't know 
who's got what amount of it. And, and also it's not necessarily linear. There's a lot of different possibilities in that space. So I, I kind of hope to, uh, to the degree to which my pieces get seen by people, by human beings, that there's a way in which it helps them reinterrogate their relationship with animals and think about what animal lives are like and think about the, um, the whole of animal lives and that that could potentially be a net good for the animals if we were doing that kind of thinking. And also breaking away from a lot of our illusions, you know, our character ideas of anthropomorphic animals that are fully like us, like Mickey Mouse. I think people bring Mickey Mouse and Beatrix Potter characters, and I happen to love Beatrix Potter characters, so this is, um, you know, but I think we tend to bring that to our understanding of animals even um, accidentally in subtle ways that don't allow us to fully um, uh, empathize with them. So I think some good could come from that um, and in some other ways as well. And I, let me see if I can find a question. There's a, there was a follow on. Yeah, there was a follow up. Yeah. So and altering animal perception, um, almost definitely not really, uh, but they're not, there's not enough duration to it. Um, I, I don't know, I can't think of a situation. I mean, they are entering the perceptual space of the animals. Um, and I guess if, if, if an animal learned, like with the lizards, the lizards I don't think are learning, but say with something like the, 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 um, uh, the, the pieces for crows and ravens and magpies, I can imagine a situation, as I said before, those only work, the displacement activity only really becomes truly meaningful as a signal if there's a, a theory of mind applied to the robot by the corvid, which arguably they can do because they have that kind of cognitive sophistication. Uh, they also have to interpret the robot as being something um, that could be have a mind. So the, that beak wiping is a displacement activity, which is sort of a fill in for stimuli that push an animal in different directions. Human beings do it too. And uh, animals that are super anxious or nervous often do those things a lot. So you've probably heard of cats that lick themselves because licking yourself as a cat is a displacement activity lick themselves until they've got no fur or parrots that preen themselves until they've got no feathers. And so uh, the fact that my robot is, is using a beak wipe in Morse code to tell these stories, but also it means that it's constantly wiping its beak. So if the, the raven doesn't see that and interpret it as an, as an entity, then the fact that it's wiping its beak all the time means it's kind of creating this, this um, uh, aura of anxiety in this pristine Arctic wilderness. And that could be I could, I could imagine that when that's going for long enough that the ravens might rethink some of the, the possibilities of what could be an entity maybe, and that would be altering. <laughs> I'm really kind of stretching it to think of an example of, of what might be a situation where the animal's perception was altered by interaction with my robot. So it feels like Steve might have something to say about it. I don't know. <laughs> Well, I can just say that the, the the piece that really got me to, you know, email or DM, I guess, Ian, was the, the lizardless legs piece. And so to me, that was really exciting because like, you know, basically you have a lizard that's kind of an automatic creature. It sort of sees a stimulus and it responds a certain way. That's a, that's a conspecific, that's another lizard that's in my territory. So I got to, you know, tell him, get out, get out of here. And Ian broke it down to its component parts. So it's sort of, Ian was sort of hacking the brain of this lizard in a way by creating this structure that, that by the virtue of the, you know, move, the nature of its movement tapped into the lizard's like sensorium and, um, and caused it to say, oh, that's another lizard. Even though it looks nothing like a lizard, it's very obvious to us and to, to anybody watching this piece that it's not a lizard, but the lizard kind of perceives it that way um, because its robot has sort of, tapped the core feature, maybe even in a, a super stimulus in his, in his second piece there. And to me, that was, you know, that, that's, that's really, that's really very intriguing. Um, and, and it sort of speaks both to human psychology and tells us something about a lizard brain. And also, I think, tells us something about how brains work, which is ultimately what us animal research, behavioral neuroscientists and so on are, are doing for a living, really, of trying to understand these principles, how are brains computing these operations. And I think, you know, approaching that simply with um, our sort of biomedical model is maybe not enough. And I think thinking about this broader perspective, which is what this forum is all about, 
um, can can really um, potentially be uh, useful for our understanding of you know brains in general. I might interject one thing about lizardless legs and area yellow bellied um, area yellow bellied blue belly, which are those two lizard robots, is that neither of them knows what a lizard looks like. They only know what a lizard push-up looks like. So they, uh, unlike other robots I've, where I'm using something that knows what the given animal it's trying to interact with looks like and identifies them based on their appearance through an object detector, an image classifier, or whatnot, this is purely based on that gesture. So you can fake it out with the gesture, although it's kind of hard to do, but you can do it by doing it with your hand, for instance. Um, but you can also have a lizard that's not doing the push-up and it won't know the lizard is there. So it's its own, the robot's own umwelt, its own sensorium is again attuned to that signal that the lizards seem to be attuned to. And actually the scientist with whom I was um, talking at the time, Stephen Adolf at Harvey Mudd, who's a lizard, Western fence lizard specialist, he says that the lizards come out of the egg already hyper-tuned to that particular syncopated pattern that they do, both looking for it and kind of doing it with their body. So it's really, really the rhythm of their life. I also think you, you don't say it specifically, but it also becomes like a modern, modernist minimal sculpture, kinetic sculpture too, where your other works, the, the, the mechanism is, is like you, is more visible, but this is, is been turned into that sort of aesthetic. Um, so, well, so can I be as, as bold as to a posit as a non-artist <laughs> that all art essentially is doing this? It's tapping into our brains for whatever reason, they work in a certain way that find certain stuff fascinating or beautiful or whatever. And art is basically stripping down the world in such a way that we basically tune into those things. And that's what people appreciate art. Is that realistic or am I crazy? Go ahead. It's, it's hard to define art. It's also hard to define robots. Those are, we have, I think, six minutes left in this thing. And I think we could be getting into some hairy territory if we tried to do either of those things. But I think that Carissa might be the best <laughs> Come on, do it again. to address. Yeah. Well, I think the thing not to get tripped up on tripped up on is beauty, because most like look at look at Ian, look at Ian's work. It's a lot of it's not really about beauty, right? Um, uh, we don't really most of us don't care anything about beauty anymore too much. You know, I don't know. There are moments, but so but I but I think still it what you're saying applies to conceptual art because at some level Ian's work is really foot it has at least one foot in good conceptual art. Um, I mean, it's an interesting way because. Because art is very hard to define, right? But there's always, I mean, I appreciate anybody's attempt to bring all of it together by one thing, one string that pulls it all together in, in some way. Um, yes, I mean, I don't know. I think it's a, a viable way of, and I love that it's coming from you because most scientists screw everything up when they try to say, it's all about beauty. And it's not very little about beauty at all. And for 150 years, nobody's cared a toot for beauty. <laughs> <laughs> it's very easy you. for us outsiders to make sweeping statements about <laughs> hey I, it's okay <laughs> um we still have a little bit of time uh walter wintel asks um for ian have you ever built robots to interact with cats or dogs um either wild or pets if so how and why uh so i haven't um and i'd I think part of the reason why is that I've been focused on the quote unquote wild um, as opposed to the domestic environment. Uh, the, the, the only pets I've really worked with at this point are Steve's pets, <laughs> which are rats. So that's the closest I've gotten to, to that. Um, but of course this turn towards synanthropic animals is a slight turn in that direction. So. I, I kind of foresee not doing anything with dogs and cats. They are, there are a lot of reasons maybe why not. I, I think, I mean, they are overrepresented um, and they are over, I don't know, they, they get a lot of attention from us. Um, they're almost too close to humans to, to be as much of a, a place where you would find something you hadn't expected, I suppose. Um, so at this point, I, I think I'm mostly still focused on that, which is really close and easy to find in the, in the garden. You know, this is in fact called, not your 
garden variety robots after all. And also the, the wilder places are the presumed wilder places. Because another thing about that Arctic environment is that as much as we imagine it is pristine, it's still very much affected by our activity. Um, so the bringing of a plastic robot into that space seems like a material sort of uh, invasion, but it's also really not different from the tiny pieces of plastic that are littered over that whole ecosystem. And, and now to, to finish up the, 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 the three zones I'm interested in, the, the third one is in the house, but it, with the animals that you aren't keeping, the, the mouse that lives in your ceiling and the rats that live in your basement um, and the pigeons that have, have found a place to roost under your eave. So I don't see myself going towards cat, dogs and cats, but I didn't see myself going towards rats. So who knows? <laughs> do you ever do anything with insects? Uh, not really. Um, there's a, there's some interesting stuff there. Part of it, it, there's a sweet spot for building a robot. It takes a lot of work to make a robot. You have to build a perception system. You have to build a power system. You have to sort of resolve it mechano sculpturally. Um, you have to kind of integrate all the other stuff that I'm interested in, the story and the actual. And uh, it, when you get to insects, you're talking about going quite small. So the, you end up, you would end up having to put a lot of work into trying to be so small. Although it's worth mentioning, since David brought it up, you know, with lizardless legs, that there's that part above the, the branch, but then there's actually a bunch of stuff underneath the branch. And sculpturally, it's still, uh, it's still there. And actually, you can see it in the gallery, right? Um, and so in a way, when I was building that, I kind of imagined a plane, which is the, the, the wood, the branch, whatever it is. And, and being in that sort of Brancusian sort of endless colony kind of thing above and having to be that sort of considered. And then below, it's very robot -y, you know? It's, just, it's almost like a, a satellite with these things sticking out and the cameras over here and, and the motors that, that, that actuate it below. So I guess, you know, I was approached once by the, um, the Natural History Museum in, in LA um, about doing some stuff with insects. And at the time I was doing stuff with lizards and I was very focused on lizards. And so I turned it down, but I can imagine uh, that I could possibly do something with insects where I've got just most of the actuation and everything else separated from the little thing, the little almost puppet thing that's with the insects. I like that your your response is about your you know your the how would we do it robotically because you're not at all in too much in doubt that that insects have stuff going on right because I love it. Charles Darwin wrote beautifully about insects right their emotional expression and you I see you don't that's not your problem but the, the thing is like how can I get it to work robotically <laughs> but it is a consideration uh, I'm I'm not actually sure I, <laughs> I'm going to ask to be brought back I think it's just my voice above you. Yeah. And uh, I hate that my appearance means that we're almost out of time for tonight. Um, I did want, we, we've got a, a group of students in the audience and I, I wanted to make one kind of concluding observation about one of the things that makes this kind of art making unique relative to a lot of art making. And what makes it so close to science is that the outcomes are un, un, unpredictable. They're unknown really when Ian sets out to make one of these robots. And this is a, a kind of risk that you know, that, that's very challenging. I mean, they're open-ended experiments with uncertain timeframes that, you know, they may not produce results that, that, that anybody expects. And, and it kind of opens up a whole new way of working that's much more akin to science than, than you know, than, than other forms of kind of media-based art. And it's, it's really exciting to see how these projects have come to fruition. Um, I wanted to thank uh, David, Ian, Stephen, and Carissa for this event. And thank you all for joining us with your questions. I invite you to join us again with Hans Bauman and Professor James Nisbet on March 9th. Um, and so thank you all. And we can stick around panels, but we'll close the event um, off. Um, so thank you, thank you. Thank you as well. Yeah. And thank you for everybody who came. You know, you know what you just said, Jesse, um, I Ian mentioned the iterative process that he, that he goes through to make these works. That, um, and I think this is something that I've noticed with a lot of media artists, the ones that understand that when they create something, it's not the end, like a painting, that they, iterating it is a very um, important part because you're, the, the, the object is sort of telling a story and then you now have an animal that wants to interact and you gotta iterate it to figure out how to get that to happen. And I think that's um, what your success comes from that iteration. Um, like a scientist, you know, observing, 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 and then coming, figuring out what's really going on. So I think that's a good uh, point, Jesse.
Well, and plus you're the expert. You're literally the world expert in the creation of robots that interact with animals at a certain scale. And, and again, like a, there's a level of specialization that all artists ultimately do as well. I mean, that's very common in art practice to become quite specialized, but it's, it's almost a step beyond you know, because you're, you know, you're just, you're committed not to say Ian, that you can't pivot to something else and make insect scale robots or not make robots. I mean, no, no one's, you know, but there's a kind of investment in this very particular and, and, and specific experiment and, and the repetition of it and how new results. I mean, I, I kind of, you know, it's, it, I feel like it's more than sciencey. I mean, in, in, in that sense, I mean, I get wanting to kind of draw for a boundary there too. Like it's not, science as science understands itself most of the time, but it's, it still has that rigor experimental rigor that science often that characterizes science. Yeah, I think it certainly has those parallels as you're pointing out. Um, and more than, even more so, um, it's not that these are just two sort of two parallel processes that are expressing each other um, in the world, but I think the interaction has been really interesting for both Ian and I, as I can speak for myself at least, it's been really inter interesting for me and it's opened my eyes in certain ways. And, and you know, obviously these are very, they're, they're parallel in some ways, but they're very different in other ways. And I think those, more more conversations along these lines could be useful to kind of lots of disciplines and and certainly art and science and their interaction. It has occurred to me that we've trapped um, Kyle from UCI uh, Media here so long as we keep talking. But I, I I hope we can all get together at the closing event on March fifth. Anybody still with us? Again, please come join us two to five p.m. on March fifth um, and see us in person. Um, I believe we'll ideally all be there. Um, so thank you again. But I don't want to keep anybody who's working behind the scenes. I'm, I'm going to no have worries. to step out for dinner. We're I'm done. sorry. We're done. Okay. All right. Hey, and I'll see everybody in a little over a week, right? Yeah. 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 Okay. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you all for putting Thank you. Uh, Great talk. Uh,